I'm Suzanne Legrand, and this is The Imaginary Possible, a show that looks at some of the cool and also some of the ridiculous and terrifying aspects of artificial intelligence. On today's show, we're going to start with talking about ChatGPT and how it works and how it personalizes information to each person, for the better and also for the worse. Then I'll be speaking with ESO Martin about how she uses ChatGPT to help her creative writing. Finally, because AI is absurd, the first episode of the AI Variety Show featuring the new Drew Show. So without further ado, ChatGPT and the wonderful, terrible world of information personalization. Imagine having a conversation with your smartest friend, the one who knows everything about everything and everyone, except that they have no social skills or real world experience, apart from what they've read online. Granted, they're voracious readers. Welcome to ChatGPT, or Generative Pre-Trained Transformer Chatbox, launched by OpenAI in November 2022. How does it work? You type a question, give it a task, and faster than you can say, my robot genie, what the, it delivers the answer to you. To understand it, it's helpful to compare it to a Google search. You type in keywords and sometimes a sentence in a Google search. For example, what is the average cost of a one-bedroom apartment in Portland, Oregon in 2023? Without a Google search, I can tell you it's way too expensive. Google returns a list of links to websites that are likely to have the information you are looking for. I can search for listings on the second and perhaps the third page, though Almost no one looks past page one or two. Now let's compare that to ChatGPT. Instead of giving you a list of web pages, ChatGPT will do its best to answer your question. It also processes the information in ways that you can specify. For example, can you create a table comparing average rental costs of a one-bedroom apartment in Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Bloomington, Illinois, and Charlottesville, North Carolina in the year 2019. Not only can I request information be delivered in a certain format, such as a table, a script, a blog post, a cover letter, I can also request level and kind of information. For example, give me three different definitions with examples that a fifth grader would understand. This is just scratching the surface of what I can ask AI to do. Instead of sending me to a web page to find the answer, ChatGPT delivers specific results tailored to my questions and requests. Given what ChatGPT can do, some compare it to having a personal assistant who is willing to help 24-7. Further, ChatGPT detects emotional tone and can provide encouragement and respond as a human might. But there's some problems too. When you get information from ChatGPT, you have no way to evaluate the credibility of the information or to know where it's coming from. In a Google search, you are given a link to a website and can evaluate the credibility of that source of information. Because we don't have the ability to evaluate the credibility of the information it gives us, we run the risk of even greater confirmation bias. That is, getting information which already agrees with what we believe to be true. With ChatGPT, the information superhighway has been replaced by an endless echoing supermall of information that reinforces our pre-existing biases. Collectively, we have seen how lack of a good flow of credible information reinforces not just confirmation bias, but contributes to polarization and division, the spread of misinformation and disinformation, and the undermining of democratic processes. 
How is ChatGPT using the detailed personal information we so willingly and freely give it? That's the question of who the man is behind the curtain. Who owns AI technology and what exactly are their intentions? What exactly are they doing with all of our data? Now on to my interview with writer ESO Martin. I am Suzanne Legrand and this is The Imaginary Possible, a show that explores the captivating potentials and the troubling realities of artificial intelligence today. Today, my guest is ESO Martin, who is a writer and novelist who began experimenting with ChatGPT to help her with her novels. To start, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name's Emanuela Martin. I write under my initials, ESO Martin. Um, I have a creative writing MFA. I've worked as a journalist and as an editor and a publisher. And so I've been working sort of like in a professional, semi-professional capacity for about 17 years as a writer. So that's my experience, you know, without AI, before AI. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I have a, a published book that I wrote, you know, before AI started being used. Um, and I also have a short story collection, which is gonna be coming out hopefully this year, but I've been saying that like, and the editing always takes longer, but I'm really, really close. So it's an illustrated short story collection. And um, so all of these stories were written before AI, but there were a couple of editing tasks that I asked uh, chat to, you know, help me out with. And I thought like, oh, okay, you know, because it's a new technology. I thought, what the heck, let's give it a try. There was a fiction writer in our group who was like, um, she was writing a story where she needed some extra progressive complications. And she asked for chat, like she told chat and GPT-3, this is my concept for the story. Can you come up with like a list of progressive complications? And I thought like, oh, that's really cool as a writer, because those list type brainstorming ideas are things that I do without chat, but that also tends to be some of this, like the, not time waster stuff, but it can take a long time of looking out the window, sort of like generating that, you know, new material, pulling it from the ether and how much more you can produce if you just like ask this thing, like, okay, can you please give me a list? I'll choose the ones I like or reject your list, but just the fact that I saw one and inspired more. So back in March, um, I went on and signed up for chat three and just sort of like gave it a go and played around with it a little bit. Um, I didn't use it for anything other than just like a few back and forth conversations, but I could automatically see like, oh, okay, this is gonna actually be a major tool for the future. And this is something that I wanna learn about because I've been, I'm typically a late adopter for technology because new technologies come out all the time and then fizzle out and don't matter. <laughs> but I could tell like, oh, this is gonna be a real game changer and I wanna learn how to use this because this is definitely in my area of expertise. And because I have all of this writing experience ahead of time, I can take the skills that I know and ask chat to take over some of the things that are, that I can do. I'm not asking it to do anything that I can't do, but I'm asking it to do things that usually are time consuming and are not, you know, like my favorite, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. And could you say like what a couple of those things are that, that you find um, time consuming and that it's just easier to have chat GPT work on? Yeah. Um, so when I started writing, I kind of started out as a discovery writer type person. And what I found is that for, for me, my experience, writing that way can be really fun in the moment. But what can happen is that I generate lots and lots of words and scenes that don't hold together. So I've learned the hard way that if I want to tell 
a story that's really going to work structurally, then I kind of need an outline ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I need a plan. And um, the planning stuff is, man, it can take a lot. It's a lot of like mental heavy lifting. And so much of what makes writing unique is a person's voice, um, their particular ethic. And um, for me, so, you know, I've got this collection I'm working on, but I'm thinking about moving forward next year. I'm probably going to start moving in the direction of writing um, young adult fantasy romance. And so that's a genre that uses um, like series typically do really well. And so this month, what I've been using chat for is like, okay, this is my serious concept. Let's come up with, you know, I'm asking it to play the role of like, you know, pretend you're a best selling, you know, uh, young adult fantasy romance author. We're going to be co-writing a book together. This is my idea for the concept. Let's generate some ideas for, for books that would fit in this concept. And so then I pick a book idea I like, and I say, all right, this is how, this is what I see the vision of this book being. Could you put, put it in an outline format using like save the cat beats? And then let's come up with a scene list after that. This is my spreadsheet that I use for, you know, understanding characters better to make sure that they have a tragic flaw, to make sure that they have like uh, allies to make sure that they have strengths, you know, so I have the typical questions that I ask myself when I'm creating a character, the questions that I usually ask myself when I'm creating a plot. And instead of doing it in a notebook with pen and paper, like I usually do, I'm just asking chat and I'm telling it the information I already have. And I'm asking it to fill in some of the blanks for me. And if it goes in a direction I don't want, I say, all right, let's you know, instead of doing that, I want to do it this way. Can you please redo it? Um, and so for that type of a thing, um, like I can outline a book in a really detailed way where I'm going from concept, character list, act structure, scene list. You know, if I were doing it without chat, um, it would probably take me several weeks to maybe even several months to get that detailed. With chat, I can do it in a day, which means I'm up and working on actual new words, new scenes much, much faster. Do you find that you're writing novels faster using chat GPT as a kind of sounding board? Well, I've only been using it this way for like a week. So it's like, it's not like oh, I've written okay. any novels this way, <laughs> but I can see like, oh, okay, wow. You know, getting to the scene list stage means that I could start tomorrow, but the way I want to work is I actually want to plan out this entire series first. So I'm like, you know, four books into like potentially an eight book series. So I'm like halfway through, but the speed with which I've been able to see the whole thing much faster, like, yeah, I don't, I like it's made it much, much easier for me to see starting. I could start on book one, scene one today, but I want to outline the entire series before I get started. Because sometimes something in book eight might influence something in book two, and I want to have that planned out first. Do you use chat GPT for things like proofreading? I haven't. I have. Um, so right now I'm actually signed up for chat GPT four mm -hmm. um, because I'm on there almost every day for writing and actually non writing things too. Like I ask it for recipes or, you know, I'm homeschooling my son so I can ask it for lesson plan type things. Um, I'm learning Polish as is my son. And so I've asked it for like Polish grammar instruction. Like, can you please explain the debt of case to me and provide examples and you know, so I'm using it for all kinds of things, not just writing. And to me, it was worth, you know, I also want to learn how to use it really well. Is there anything that you would not use? Chat I wouldn't ask it to write the book for me. Mm -hmm. why, not? <laughs> why not? Um, well, because it's not very good at continuity. And also the writing of it is the fun part for me. So I'm preserving that for myself. And also the way I kind of see... You know, like the, it's sort of like a gray area for uh, who owns the copyright of that thing right now. So I, if I were to write a book, I would want to definitely make sure that I was, I mean, even with the outlining, there's a lot of human input going into this because 
its initial ideas are often very generic. And so it takes me and my vision to add specificity. Um, usually it's first act is very slow. Um, I have asked it to draft like scene parts before just to kind of like experiment. And um, I don't know, like the, sometimes the writing it comes up with, like I wouldn't use it that way. It would need to be heavily edited. Like it'll use a lot of Tom Swifties. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, I have a lot of stories in me that I wanna write and I want its help to get me through the things that usually bog me down so that I can get to the things that I like faster. That makes sense. Writing is one of them. <laughs> what do you think about the criticism that some writers have of um, not just Chat GPT, but all of the all of AI in terms of using other writers' works to train on and essentially using copyrighted material? Well, I think it's really tricky with the really big name people because, so for example, George R. R. Martin, it, it might have never read any of his books, but there's so many blog posts. There's so many book summaries. There's so many movie commentaries that are, you know, like free on the web that chat could have read, you know, like uh, book reviews where maybe they have a sentence here, sentence there, and those are all within the licensable, you know, framework for those authors. And I can see how chat might have like, you know, with all of the information that's out there for free, it could probably have connected the dots on its own about what happens in these books without having read the books. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's the argument of, you know, keep working on new things. Um, and, so far, the publishers haven't sued. So far, it's just writers suing. So, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, yeah, it it's sort of like, an, it's a new technology. And right now, lots of things about it haven't been monetized. So, for example, when I look up recipes, if I try and Google recipes, there was once a time where people were just putting recipes up. Now, every time I try and Google a recipe, for bread, it's got like ads, pop-ups, you know, sign up for my newsletter, all of that extra stuff um, that has been monetized. And all of the first Google searches are all paid for ads, right? So, so far chat GPT hasn't had that happen to it yet. Although I do feel like that's a inevitability where it'll start pointing people towards things that maybe have been paid. And right now it's still, um, it hasn't turned into that yet. <laughs> so I want to use it as much as I can before it gets all junked up with advertisements. For other writers who are thinking about um, using some of these tools, what would you suggest that they they do? Um, I would suggest that they kind of treat it like a writing um, partner where, or I don't know, almost like a ghostwriter where you're giving it really specific instructions about what you want. And also that um, if it's if the story that chat comes up with doesn't fit with your vision, you correct it and just go with your vision because like I would say to use it as a tool to help write the book of your heart because that's why we're writing, right? We're not writing something that can be copied and imitated. I mean, there's so many other ways with which a person can make money, you know? So if it's about paying the bills, you know, there's other ways to do it. Uh, a lot of people are writing, you know, because they want to tell a story of their heart. And so they can use this tool to help them do that. Another thing I would say is that it's, you know, if you think about chat as like, like it's not omniscient. So another thing I would say is like, don't, don't, fact check everything it gives you. So for example, if it's, if, so for an example, so I'm, uh, the series that I'm planning out has to do with uh, young adult romantic fantasy, but set in a Polish mythological setting. And so one of the books that I was planning was about the mermaid of Warsaw. And so I said, all right, let's come up with an outline for the mermaid of Warsaw. Here's the characters, here's the story. And so it starts out like in a seaside town of Warsaw. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold your horses, Warsaw is landlocked. 
you know, it's not by the sea. So you have to also do your research and not just trust what it gives you because it might be incorrect information. It's not, it's not an omniscient tool. It's, but it's still a tool. Like think about how much easier it is to drive around using Google Maps instead of using, you know, uh, a map <laughs> or just winging it and asking for directions. To me, chat as a tool is sort of like it's it's a use it like a it's like it's a map. This is my destination. This is where I want to go. Please give me the steps to get there. Do you use find that it, it gives you better information if you ask it nicely? No. I mean, I, I always talk to it nicely. I say, please. Um, and I also, when it, so this is actually part of training it. If it gives you what you want, then you should say thank you because that's giving it input that it gave you correct information. If it gave you something that you don't want, don't say thank you, good job, and then tell you what you want corrected because that's giving it contradictory information. So when it gives me something that I don't want, I'll tell it the parts of it that I liked that I wanted to preserve for its next iteration. So I'll say, thank you. I really liked the characterization here. And I really liked, you know, what you did for scenes, you know, 25 through 27. So I'm giving it feedback on the part of its answer that worked for me that I want to preserve for its next attempt. And then I tell it specifically what I want changed in the next attempt. I've heard this from like romance authors. Like if you ask it to write a steamy romance scene, it might, because chat GPT has guardrails on it, it might instead give you like a advice on safe sex or something like that. And it won't produce the scene that you want. So you have to specify that you want it to be in fiction. There's another um, AI writing tool that's really popular that has um, first draft ability and also outline ability. That one's called pseudo write. And I haven't played around it with it yet, but a lot of writers, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I have a feeling that a lot of writers are doing this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fun thing to play around with. It's really awesome as a brainstorming tool and as an outlining tool. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. And so if people want to learn more about my work, um, my website is esomartin at um, esomartin.com. Yeah, www.esomartin.com. And I also have a free short story available for readers to download. It's called Heart in a Jar. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a dark fantasy type story. When is the short story collection coming out? Hopefully before the end of the year. The book, the collected short stories is called What We Talk About When We Talk About the Apocalypse. So these are all short stories written between um, this year and uh, so over the last 17 years. So 2006 to now, having to do with relationships, apocalypses, personal, relational, global, but most of the stories have to do with relationship themes. You're listening to The Imaginary Possible, a show about the captivating potentials and troubling realities of artificial intelligence today. I'm Suzanne Legrand, and this is KBOO Community Radio, KBOO 90.7 FM in Portland. To listen to this and other episodes of The Imaginary Possible, visit us online at kboo.fm or theimaginarypossible.com. One of the issues in the writer's strike now ended was the use of artificial intelligence. Drew Barrymore decided to resume production of her talk show before the end of the writer's strike and decided to cross the picket line. She said, I stand by my my decision, or something of that effect. And then she was called out as a scab, which she was, and she got a lot of blowback. I think that's what they call bad publicity. And then she announced she would be stopping production of her show, and she was sincerely sorry for anyone she hurt. And I'm ad-libbing here, but... I really am sorry to writers I offended. I would never disrespect you. I love writers. It really wasn't her best moment. And then the strike ended, and it was okay to resume production, and Drew Barrymore went back to work. But three of her staff writers chose not to come back. So that's probably more than you need to know to give you the context for the first AI show skit 
The New Drew Show. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to embark on a journey into the whimsical world of Hollywood's most enduring and eccentric star. Welcome to the new season of The Drew Barrymore Show, where the extraordinary meets the ordinary and the quirky reigns supreme. Wait, is that really the new opening? The quirky reigns supreme? Drew, we're on a tight shooting schedule. Time is money. She's been a beloved actress, a producer, and an author. But above all, she's been unapologetically herself. Now, Drew is taking her unique brand of entertainment to the talk show stage, where she'll be your guide through a world of laughter, heartfelt conversations, and unforgettable moments. Buckle up for a roller coaster of emotions as Drew sits down with some of the biggest names of the industry, bringing you their untold stories and hidden talents, all while sprinkling her signature Drewisms along the way. Drewisms? Who wrote this crap? You know who wrote it. You signed off on it, remember? Yes, but you said no one would be able to tell the difference. No, I said it would cut costs. You know how much we'd have to pay a writer at scale? This is entirely free. Yes, but it's too... wordy, or... Just read the script. Maybe we could get someone to edit it. A real person. I just saw a woman in the hallway. That's the cleaning woman, and her last day is tomorrow. Soon we're going to be fully automated. There's just something off. Yes, but think about the money we're saving on production costs. Hi, everyone! How are you doing today? I am so beyond thrilled to welcome our very first guest. She's an absolute force of nature in the world of cinema. From her breakout role in Bend It Like Beckham to her performances in period dramas like Pride and Prejudice and Atonement, Kira has this incredible ability to transport us to different worlds with every role she takes on. Please give a warm, quirky welcome to the one and only Kira Knightley. Welcome. Thank you, Drew. I've been a fan of your work for as long as I can remember. Today, we're going to dive deep into Kira's remarkable journey in Hollywood and her thoughts on the everlasting landscape of the film industry. Thank you. Plus... You won't want to miss the surprise I have in store for her. A little something to bring out her inner quirkiness. Oh dear, I don't know quite what that means. It's going to be a ride you won't forget right after this commercial. The best taste in chicken comes in a can. What's it called? Tuna of the land. I can't read this. It's way too wordy. I did wonder if I was going to get a word in edgewise. Just read the script. Hey there, Kira. It's so awesome to have you here on the show. You know, I've been hearing some interesting buzz lately. I heard you've copyrighted your face. Yes, it's true. You've all seen Unreal Keanu. I've heard he's a passable dancer, but the things that deepfake technology make it seem like he can do, it's unsettling. I know. Some people think that this show isn't really me, that I'm a fake. Can you believe that? It's getting harder and harder to tell what's fake and what's real. As celebrities, we're particularly vulnerable because our image is everywhere. Oh. We interrupt this broadcast for a public service announcement. The Drew Barrymore Show will not be returning after all. What? We're in the middle of shooting. Advertisers don't want to be associated with a scab. I'm not a scab. I'm a businesswoman. As your social media manager slash PR crisis management consultant, I've had to do some serious damage control. But I offered to hire a human being to edit the script. People perceive you to be out of touch. I'm all for authenticity. All I wanted was to bring light entertainment and celebrity gossip to the masses. Yes, but now we need you, only woke. I'm woke. Look, I've already taken taking care of your major socials. Let Woke Drew do the talking. Woke Drew? 
I have no words to express my deepest apologies to anyone I have hurt. And of course, to our incredible team who works on the show and has made it what it is today. Oh. We really tried to find our way forward and I truly hope for a resolution for the entire industry very soon. I never said that. Shh. Let woke Drew speak. Sorry. But after the media storm blows over, we'll see about transitioning you back into a speaking role. Stay tuned for another season of the Drew Barrymore Show, where the extraordinary meets the ordinary and the quirky reigns supreme. Coming soon, but not quite yet. Voices and inspired sound design by the incredible musician and vocal talent, Ed Gibbons. And also, Dina Hamida, woman of many voices, all of, from somewhere in Southern California. You're listening to The Imaginary Possible, a show about the captivating potentials and troubling realities of artificial intelligence today. I'm Suzanne Legrand, and this is KBOO Community Radio, KBOO 90.7 FM in Portland. To listen to this and other episodes of The Imaginary Possible, visit us online at kboo.fm or theimaginarypossible.com. Thanks so much for listening.